The emergence of COVID-19 has forced the legal industry to rapidly undergo a fundamental transformation. I'm Jack Newton, CEO and co-founder of Clio, the world's leading cloud-based legal software provider. In each episode of Daily Matters, we'll explore what this new normal means for law firms, how legal professionals can find success while working remotely, and how lawyers can best serve their clients during this unprecedented time. Today, we have the privilege of welcoming Caddy Goshtasby, a lawyer, author, speaker, and CEO of Purist Consulting. Caddy, thanks for being here. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Jack. So, Caddy, first of all, uh, we open this podcast with uh, one question, and that is, how are you doing? Uh, how's your family doing? And uh, tell us a little bit about any changes you've experienced personally as a result of COVID-19. Yeah, thanks for asking, right? I, um, I'm doing great. Um, I'm one of those weirdos that um, has spent so many years working on myself and my brand have you that I feel like I'm like ready for this crisis. No one's really ready for it, but you know, as ready as I can be. I have my bad moments too, don't get me wrong. Like today when I went to the grocery store, you just get there and everything feels very surreal. However, you know, I've developed so many, um, not just coping method, methods and mechanisms, but just ways to thrive. So we're doing good, but you know, we're all at home. My husband's a dentist, so the dental office is definitely shut down. There's nothing going on there. Yep. So they're all crammed into the other side of the house. So we have our privacy here and it's, um, I'm enjoying this lower pace. I really am. I think uh, I do this thing called silver linings on social media and I'm always looking for those silver linings for myself and for others. And for me, it has been uh, the slowness of business and the world has been um, therapeutic for me to say the least. And I think I'm hoping it'll have the same effect for others. So um, that's been the impact. We're eating a lot of good food at home and um, didn't even know I could cook so much at home. The rest of us could yeah. eat so much at home, right? And it's really together time, which um, the world is forced on us. And so what are we going to learn from it rather than how are we going to be a victim of it is what I do my very best to look at it. And I'm not perfect, but that's, that's where I am with it. And um, I'm pretty proud of myself. Yeah, I think that's a, a great perspective. And how do we approach this crisis as an opportunity to to learn and experience new things and maybe notice things about this new experience that might be improved over the way things used to be. And I, I know in my own uh, in my own day to day, you know, both professionally and personally, I've I've really honed in on a few things that I've done differently and and preferred over over the way things quote unquote used to be. Um, and uh, uh, shifting gears a little bit uh, in, in terms of what you're thinking about, I, I'd love to just just hear what's top of mind for you right now. What do you find yourself thinking about most deeply these days? Um, yeah, it's a great question you asked. Top of mind for me really these days is um, I just have a deep connection to people and I have um, deep empathy for what we're all going through. And I feel a very, very much that what this has brought about as a result of opportunity, the way you called it, which I really liked is um, how we can appreciate who we are as people. So top of mind for me has been how I can support people out there. Cli not just clients, which I'm checking in on regularly, but just whatever skill set I have, how can I bring that to people and help people? I'm not even looking at it from a business perspective, really just how can I know, bring what I know to be value add so people can feel better. People can feel somewhat like I feel right now, which isn't great, but it's better than not. So you, you came, Caddy, to the United States. You've got a fascinating background. You, you came to the United States when you were just six years old. Your family was fleeing the Iranian Revolution. So you've dealt with crazy life-altering altering circumstances before. Uh, what do you remember from that time? And do you see any parallels to what's happening today? And is there, there anything from that experience that you feel has equipped you well for for the, the COVID-19 crisis. Yeah, you know, that was so many years ago, right? I Thanks for doing your homework on me. I was six and now I'm gonna be 48. Uh, so it was a long time ago, but I vividly remember that. And, you know, all my life leading up to this crisis, I was hoping that was gonna be the only, you know, startling big giant change I had to go through in my life. But this has been um, more life altering for me, believe it or not, in certain ways, because as an adult, when you deal with these things, 
um, there's a whole different level of responsibility, right? You're responsible not just for yourself, but other people's welfare, whether they're your children, your aging parents, your spouse, whatever is going on in your client base as well. And so um, the parallels are quite a lot. Change, right? And that's why I, people always called me and I call myself an expert in change because you have to become adaptable and develop ways, methodologies of finding your own inner strength to deal with these changes. Changes and um, use them to your benefit and use it to benefit society. So when we left Iran, yeah, we left with two suitcases thinking we were never going to go back um, or actually thinking we were going to go back. And then we eventually realized we could never go back because of the unrest. And so um, it took a long time to get acclimated, Jack, to being a Midwesterner. I grew up in Indiana and I wanted to save the world by being a lawyer. And um, I took what I knew as an immigrant and I put it into action. And I did that for many years until I changed careers. So the parallels with that and COVID-19 is it's disruption. It really is disruption. And you know, as a child, I never had the tools or the means to take that disruption and uh, utilize it well to grow. I naturally did that and thank heavens I had good family structure and my parents helped me out right helped themselves out too so we could grow and adapt but what i've coined adapt and adopt people don't so you know you and i've had this conversation around technology when lawyers don't adapt and adopt the technology they think it's the technology's fault it's not we have to take responsibility and control so uh when i look out there at this um covid19 situation um, the only thing I have to hang my hat on and to rely on is myself and my own self-control and self-awareness, just like I did when I was an immigrant. So what are my options? You know, I get to decide and that's empowering, right? And, and, and maybe that's a good segue to my next question, which is what do you think is most important to keep in, in mind? What should your mindset be approaching a crisis like this? Yeah, that um, no crisis is insurmountable as long as you really shift your focus. You know, people call it mindset, but I always explain it differently to my lawyer clients because you've got to use the right words. I say reframe, okay? Mm -hmm. Are we going to take a situation and reframe it so we see the other facets of it, the other angles of it, and the silver linings of it? That is the only way we're going to get through anything. And, you know, how we handle one situation is how we handle every situation. I have a large, large client that called me, um, one of their executives called me and said, you got to tell me how to deal with this staff staying at home. Like, I don't know how to motivate them. I don't know how to empower them. I said, look, this is also a very good way after I coached them through it. I said, this is also a very good way for you to figure out who in your staff is managing themselves. Well, these are, this is a big crisis, but those little fires at work, they're putting out the same way. If they're can't, yeah. they can't manage themselves. They can't manage that. So mindset and how we think through things and how we handle any kind of an emergency you know, today in the grocery store, for example, that's a really good example of this. Are you just grabbing anything in front of you and thinking like, oh my gosh, what if we ran out of cereal? Or are you spending some methodical time grounding yourself, having self-control, thinking through things methodically so you can actually act in a way that is not just responsible, but in the business setting, the parallel would be that puts you in a position where people remember you and want to follow you and, and actually respect you and, and you inspire them, right? And at the grocery store, that's possible too, right? I think. So it's a mindset. Tell me a little bit more about why you think using the term reframing works better with lawyers than thinking about changing your mindset. Yeah, because I think words become cliche. And according to Marianne Williamson, I agree with her wholeheartedly, uh, you know, things are cliche because they're often said, but they're often said because they're accurate. So it is a mindset shift. But, you know, uh, love us lawyers, God bless us lawyers, we're over texted, over tweeted, over caffeinated, I say. And so we're now we're trapped at home with absolutely no attention span because we're always so busy producing results. And so now we're worrying about it. So now we're really not listening. So if I had said brand or mindset before, it would have gone right over somebody's head. But now, especially, I, it, you know, it takes a lot more patience. My husband and I were talking about that this morning. He's like, why are all these webinars live? Why can't I just watch the replay whenever I feel like it, learning about an implant? And I said, 
well, because it feels good to put something live on and help people like set a schedule even at home. And he goes, well, I don't, if I don't want to watch it, then I don't want to have to wait until watch it then. <laughs> so it's a patience thing, right? He's yeah. a dentist, but no one's immune from that, right? That's certainly one reframe on it. So with lawyers, I think we, we have to have someone who cares about us. That's the benefit of being a consultant and a coach really say, Hey, look, I want you to step back and let's, let's dissect this and let's look at it from a different perspective because as lawyers were trapped in our left linear analytical brain all day long. I was, when I was a practicing securities lawyer and most of us are a plus B equals C that's how we do good work. However, our right creative brains is where our ability to market and sell ourselves, our brand, if you will, shines through. So when I take a lawyer and I say, let's look at it differently, let's not use the word mindset because they've heard it and they compartmentalize that immediately in their left linear brain as check the box. I'm smart. I know what that means. But when you really paint it draw it out with the story and explain it a different way, then you're allowing them to adapt and use their right creative mind to kind of parse through that data. Because everything I teach is from a right brain subconscious processing of data. Nothing I say is one plus one equals two. So I have to explain it that way in order to have them organically tap into the right brain. Does that make right. sense? Yep. No, that's a, a very helpful elaboration. Thank you. You've referred to your clients a few times. I'd love for you to explain and, and tell us the story behind Purist Consulting. Yes. Yeah, so um, I had a thriving legal career and I was mostly in Washington, D.C. I was a federal lobbyist on the Hill. Then I was at the Securities and Exchange Commission when Enron blew up. I was then at a major law firm with really big clientele. And then I went in-house here in California. So I've had the privilege of serving in many roles as a lawyer. And then I just burnt out, Jack. It was two years mm -hmm. before the recession, and I had spent 15 hours drafting a prospectus. I went home. I threw away my own prospectus reflexively in the mail that night by coincidence. And that's when I realized I couldn't do that anymore. I was making a lot of money and I was very powerful as people would say, but it was a very hollow experience. It was a very personal decision. I don't ask other lawyers to do this at all. In fact, I don't want lawyers to do what I did because it was very painful, frankly. And we need good lawyers out there. We need good lawyers producing good results. But when I did that, I found out that my natural skill set laid somewhere else. And so my natural skill set is to figure out people's brands, law firms' brands, lawyers' brands. And by that, I really mean, who are you? Why do you do what you do every day well? And how do we take your story and who you are and your firm and actually take that foundation of the people's brand and turn it into a business brand that thrives, that then actually is able to retain content, retain clients, retain employees, you use technology platforms well, efficiency becomes a major player in that equation. But for me, it's all because people know who they are and they actually bring their whole human to work. And then from that understanding grows the business, the law firm brand, but also the efficiencies that people want to have at play. So that's what we do now. And I'm just blessed and fortunate that I have the opportunity. And really, when I tell my audiences and my clients, because I speak and I actually spoke at your conference last year, is that this, I went through this because it was super difficult, but I've turned it into a program where you don't have to go through the heck that I went through, frankly. I've made it manageable for people to figure this out for themselves because not only is it empowering, it just gives you an intentional branding plan to grow the legal business in the firm. So branding, I'm sure for many lawyers today is the, the furthest thing from their, their mind, uh, but maybe it shouldn't be. And I'm, I'm curious, why do you think branding is important uh, overall? And how do you view it in a, in a crisis situation like this? Does it become more or less important? Yeah, that's a really good question, Jack. It's more important than ever because our brand starts with our own brand, right? I, I'm always just explaining this distinction to my audiences. Uh, the business brand is only as good as the people's brand, right? And when we are unsure of who we are, then we cannot grow a business. But forget growing a business right now, right? We're just trying to sustain yes. and live, right, basically. and that's, Sur Survive that's, might be survive. the bar for yes, some. Thank yeah. you. It really is. So, But how are we going to thrive while we're surviving? right? Because if we have such a breakdown of our brands, if our brand is defined the way I explain it as who are you? 
What are those natural skill sets that you have and how do we bring them to market later once the doors open up again? But you can't let this decay happen. So many people are telling me, uh, that, hey, you know, this is the time where I'm going to work on myself and I'm going to work on business development and personal development because they understand how in my world, the brand is, goes hand in hand. So if you don't have a healthy understanding and a good solid foundation for you, who you are, uh, the Clio brand follows the Jack brand and follows every other employee's brand at Clio, for instance. There's no distinction because I don't know what Clio is. I don't know what that logo really stands for. But if I've interacted with any of your employees or any law firm employee, that's how I connect the dots. I correlate the business success with the person's success. So when you're sitting at home, it is so important to cultivate this, as I tell everybody on my webinars and your audience as well. If you can even barely master this or some get somewhere, make a dent in this, now in crisis, you're going to be golden once you get back. And I know you're going to be more busy, but you will have had an ability to flex this muscle and get some order in, in place. And it should make you feel good to work on this right now because it, it is empowering rather than sitting at home and worrying, which is so disempowering because you know this will end sometime. It has to. This too will pass. This too shall pass. That's right. So I, on that note, I, I think there's many lawyers listening that are finding themselves less busy than usual. And, and one of the things I've been talking about a lot are what investments can you make over this time period that actually sets you up to be stronger mm -hmm. exiting this crisis than when you entered it. And I think for many people, the concept of building a personal brand and by extension, building a, a law firm brand or a company brand is, is secondary to, um, is secondary to the, the day-to-day -day business. As you, as you mentioned, you're just, your, your day is so filled up with activity. You don't have a chance to think about these things, but, but perhaps during this crisis is, is actually a good opportunity to start thinking about your, your brand and how you set that up to, both stand out during the crisis, but then really come out of the crisis in a stronger position. And maybe you could describe what the first steps you could take in moving in the direction would be. Are there uh, resources you'd recommend, books, websites? Uh, I, I know that you've got um, you know, a number of thoughts on that front. I would love for you to, to share them. Yeah, thank you for asking. It's so important for people to feel like there's resources available. Aside from all these webinars that these great companies are doing to tell us how to deal with the employment side of things and COVID this and COVID that from a very substantive thing, there are so many great companies out there that are just pumping out free information like I am just to help people. So I love Hay House, for instance. They're actually an, a global company, publishing company. They're based out of here in Carlsbad, California. And all of their authors who are very well known uh, international authors have taken a platform to offer free content. So if you just go to Hay House and sign up, they'll start sending you emails and there's good free content that they're putting out there just to help people. There's cooking classes. There's, you know, my husband's taking an electric guitar class online. Like there's all sorts of things like that you can do. But I think the first place I'd ask people to start is self-awareness. Are you getting up every day and how, what's your outlook? And how are you choosing to go inside and really center yourself and ground yourself? Because it's not that different right now than it is when we're busy because it's that, that storm is still brewing, right? It's just, I get up and I'm bombarded by travel and speak here and say this and meet this person and, and run this program. But you know, it's, it's a flurry of activity, but right now internally, I think people are having a flurry of activity out of fear. So really every morning I get up and I still have a routine. It's shifted, but I get up at really early in the morning, which is now not, not so early, frankly, anymore. It's six, you know, instead of five. Um, but I do an hour of meditation and then I journal just, just to get my thoughts on paper. It makes such a difference in my day. And then I work out. You know, we have, we're lucky to have somewhat of a home gym and then I do some yoga and then my day gets going and I have been taking courses online. I took a copywriting course. Um, I, I took courses that I didn't really think I needed, but I do. And then, um, 
and I, and I've been doing a lot of reading and reflecting, but I've been putting out free content for people too, because I just sat down and I thought, what do people need? And I decided what they needed was more free content from me because it just feels good to offer things to people that they normally wouldn't tap into. But if I had to give one tip, uh, how are you going to sit still and practice sitting still and going deep inside and having self-awareness? Because, um, all things start and end there. And when we're out there running, hitting the pavement, pounding the pavement, uh, we're not aware of that. And then you have to put an automatic pause on and come take one of my courses. But right now, like it's forced on you. So just try it for yourself. One of the, one of the things I've heard from, from lawyers and, and you, you've spoken about this as well. And I, I think this ties into your comment around self-awareness um, you know, as lawyers are often hesitant to have their personality show through too strongly. And even okay. social media, you see a lot of trepidation around getting out on platforms like Twitter and having a, a voice. And I, I think the defense mechanism is to fall back on the, the, the glitzy downtown office space or, or whatever as, as kind of the, the thing that is evoking your brand as opposed to your personality. Um, and, and maybe again, the silver lining to this crisis is that some of that falls away and you're, you don't have any edifice around you. It's just you and everyone's on a zoom call. <laughs> and, and, you know, <laughs> how, how does that factor in, in your mind to, uh, uh, this idea of building your, your, your brand and maybe it, it's, it's renewed and reinforced importance in, in this crisis. Mm -hmm. Really good. Um, you just succinctly put it together so well, Jack. Yeah, everyone, no one wants to focus on themselves, which is why I run this business. When I stopped practicing, I realized, oh my goodness, the recession was coming and lawyers had no way of taking care of business because they had relied on the moniker behind them for so long in the brand of the firm. And I started asking lawyers, uh, how are you going to sell yourself? And they were like, I have no idea. And I asked my husband, who's a dentist, he had a new dental office. I said, how are you going to get people in the chairs to save their lives? And he said, they didn't teach me that in dental school. And I thought, oh my God, this is a tragedy, right? I naturally have those skill sets, but it took me like, what, 15 years of practicing before I listened after people kept asking me for it. But I realized it's a human condition. We're so averse to figuring out who we are, much less putting it out there for fear of drawing attention, basically, at the end of the right. day to ourselves. But it's deeper. Do you know how much work I've done, even up to like last week, and, and figuring out what's, what's going on and unearthing all this stuff and the, the childhood? It's painful, right? So I always tell all my audiences, it takes courage. So now we're thrust into that situation, right? Where we're at home and we're kind of feeling trapped, although I would like people to reframe it and not call it being trapped and just having an opportunity to sit with ourselves. And Start looking at all those things about yourself that could be categorized as so great. How could it be bad to be who you are and own who you are? At the end of the day, we take our human to work and no one is buying anything except how we emotionally resonate with our audience. And that's a human to human endeavor. 78% and above of everything you and I purchase, including content like the technology is not based on what the technology does. It's based on what emotion it evokes in me to have that, say, technology. And if the person sitting in front of me brings out that emotion in me because we're animate objects, then I'm likely to buy. And that's based on a variation of happiness. So I want every lawyer to stop and think, why is it that I'm so afraid of showing up? And when is it going to be enough to, to realize that I do matter and I'm good enough. And what I have to say as a person proceeds my legal knowledge. You know, at first people buy who we are and they attach to that credibility based on the emotional high they have with us. And then they'll buy anything we're selling us. Not that we're we're going to, you know, sell them snake oil, but really to really start to get sort of comfortable in our own body yeah. that we can't constantly be hearkening back to what we do because it's so saturated, right? So I'm not saying anything new, but I'm asking people to get uncomfortable with themselves. You know, we are uncomfortable anyway, because you're in fear. Why don't you turn that into self-reflection and start kind of owning the pieces and parts of who you are? If nothing else, I'll give one bit of self-work. Sit down and start writing your story. 
Start from the first memory you have of, of being a child. And I do this in all my programs in Branding Boot Camp. And just type out what you remember memory by memory, okay? There's a lot more work we do with that there, but you don't need me there right now just to get it down on paper. And why does that make you so uncomfortable to go through that process? You know, it's a little bit therapeutic for sure. I've been called the business therapist before, and I'm fine with that because we can't do good business without knowing how good we are as people. Right. Yeah. I, I think, you know, the, the earlier comments we had around this actually being maybe a great time to, you know, spend the energy in creating your brand because you actually maybe have a little bit of spare time, slack time to, to do that. I, I think couples really nice with this idea that you are sitting with yourself as you put it. Uh, and, and maybe that's actually a great moment for, for self discovery and, and to do the hard work around, the self-realization and self-reflection that's that's required to to really connect with what you think your uh, your brand's about and and maybe shifting gears a little bit to the the client perspective on all of this. I, I'm I'm curious what yeah, your man. yeah what your take is on you know what clients are always looking for maybe like what are some of the the touchstones that we can count on remaining uh, constant over time. But especially, what do you think clients are looking for in this kind of a crisis situation? What are they looking for in in law firms in general, and and specifically their lawyers that uh, we may want to be especially cognizant of in this climate? Yes. So I'm a researcher, right? I'm a behavioral researcher, so I'm always looking at trends. And let me let me start with my formal research. So I did research at UCLA about a decade ago, and here's my research summary. There's a direct inverse correlation between our stress and our self-confidence. So as stress goes up, and it naturally does, and right now it's at an all-time high legitimately, our self-confidence starts to drop proportionally. So we don't emotionally resonate with our audience. We're not coming across well. We can't sell ourselves. We can't sell a product. Uh, it's not working for us, right? So that's the general rule. And right now with everyone's stress so high, uh, I've run into a lot of businesses that are hurting themselves tremendously by pushing, pushing to sell, uh, staying open. Like um, our ophthalmologist, who was a new ophthalmologist, we had a general routine eye exam scheduled, right? And so about my husband shut down the 19th, the dental office, the 19th. And so uh, his appointment was the week after that. And they called and they said, well, we just want to confirm his eye doctor appointment. And I said, why are you open for a routine eye exam? They're like, well, we don't think there's anything wrong. And this is being blown out of proportion. And it's a great time for you to come in and for him to get his eyes checked. And I said, oh my goodness. I mean, I didn't say anything because, you know, I don't offer advice when I'm not asked. But I did get off the phone and I thought, hmm, I, I, I totally get businesses have to stay in business. Law firms have to stay in business. You know, we all do, you and I. I mean, it's the same premise, but you have to balance that out with what the perception of your business brand is when you uh, don't play by the same rules as everyone else. When you're pushing too hard, when you're coming across from a place of non-authenticity and not really caring, um, greed as we call it, right? Yep. And people aren't doing that. I'm sure this ophthalmologist wasn't doing that consciously, but that's what I'm talking about. Everything we work on in people's brands is the subconscious processing of data. I took that message and I subconsciously processed it. Well, I consciously, because this is what I do all day, but it turned into greed, right? And I was not happy. So I posted it very lightly on Facebook and the responses came back. People were angry and they listed all their service providers who they were canceling because they didn't like the way they were staying open too long. And so maybe they were wrong. Maybe people were trying to really be of service, but for a law firm clientele, how I see it is people want to be touched right now, right? People want to be connected to so the best thing to do is take your list of clients and everybody just start calling clients. I mean, it's already two weeks into it, but even if you haven't started, just start connecting. Hey, how are you? What do you need? I've been doing that with my clients. Here's some tips I've been sharing. Do you want to have a call? Checking in and people have been so grateful that I care. Okay. So the whole point comes down. This is true regardless of COVID-19 or not. Do you care about your clients from a perspective of just checking in on them and how are they doing? It's a very traditional sales tool to touch into your client base. But right now, more than ever, I think firm clients are thinking to themselves, if I'm not paying you $500 an hour, do you still care about me to call, to call, reach out to me? 
or yeah. are you looking for work, right? Just that simple gesture, right? Just, Just checking in in a gesture. completely yeah. human way. Just a completely human way. And then really thinking of it as training that you should always be doing this, even when you're super busy. This is par for the course. And what system are you now going to implement so that you do that regularly? And then how are you going to take your unique services as a law firm and adjust them so that you can offer it to clients in a different way? So I'll take a client of mine, um, divorce mediation lawyers, right? And it's been slow, right? So they've taken some of the work to Zoom, but divorce mediation really works in person, right? You're all sitting there. And I said, look, maybe we're just going to suspend divorce mediation right now from a legal perspective, and you guys can become pseudo counselors and therapists to people. You're not going to, you know, hold yourself out as a therapist because that's illegal, but what offerings can you give to people because people still have plenty of money to spend, Jack. It's not that people aren't hiring people. I've been hired in all mm -hmm. of this, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just what, how can you creatively, and again, back to your right creative brain as a law firm, what services do you have that you can repackage so that in times of crisis, you can offer them to your clients right now. And it's not really to make money, but they will spend money if they think it's valuable. And that's the other thing I've been selling, I've been teaching, excuse me, is people call me all the time, lawyers, are you allowed to sell in a crisis time? And I'm like, you always are selling, you must sell in a crisis if you truly have something that's valuable to people. Okay. Yep. Shame on you if you're not selling. So, but there's a harmony there. You sell from the heart. You sell because you care about people as a law firm instead of selling because it's what you do, right? There's a distinction yeah. there. Yeah. I think it's a great, a great perspective. When you, when you think about being authentic, you think about the, your, your previous comment around the level, level of stress that you're experiencing being inversely correlated with your, your confidence and, and, and so on. How, how do you think lawyers go about authentically projecting a brand that feels like it's in control right now? If you feel like that's what your clients are looking for is that, that stability and the, maybe the don't worry, everything's going to be okay. I know how to get us through this kind of uh, um, feeling from their, their, their lawyer. How, how do you navigate that, that uh, kind of, juxtaposition in terms of how you might actually be feeling versus what your clients are looking for in you? Or, or, or is there a way of reconciling those two things? Such a great question. Absolutely. There's one word that comes to mind and nobody's going to like hearing this. It's going to make everybody uncomfortable and you're all going to roll your eyes and think it's woo woo, but it's not vulnerability, right? Yep. So I just get on and go, Hey, I'm not having a great day. It's about being raw, right? So or I'm not, you know, I had a tough morning. I did one webinar where I was like, pardon my language, maybe I'm not allowed to use the word shit on your show. You, Shoot, no, this is a, a profanity laden show, no problem. <laughs> so I said, hey, I lost my shit last night. Yep. I just did, right? And then I explained it and I unraveled it and I explained what I did around it. And it was so helpful to people, right? So just being vulnerable and picking up the phone and saying, hi, this is your lawyer so-and-so. Um, we're having a tough time of it over here, but we really care about all of you guys, not just as clients, but as humans. How are you guys doing? How are you guys holding up? Like I had my copyright editor from my book just email me and say, are you doing okay? I mean, she's in the middle of editing my book, but she just, you know, just a random email. It was so thoughtful, right? Are you doing okay? And that's all it said. It was really thoughtful, right? So just picking up the phone and in order to support people and be strong, and I know there's a gender distinction here, men are really wired to protect and provide for us women, but in general, to take care of others, whether they're your clients or whether they're, you're leading them in an organization, it's not about having the stiff upper lip as we often think. That's the old mentality with how brands thrive. It's really about saying, I'm human, you're human, but I care about you. And if I care about you, it means I care about me. And that's a very strong brand, someone that cares about themselves enough to be able to externalize that. And here's how I'm getting through. What can we do to support you? And how can you support us? Really, this goes both ways. Because when, as a law firm, you say to clients, we're asking for this kind of support, then people also start thinking differently. They're like, oh, I can contribute to you as my lawyer. Maybe I can send you business. That's one way of contributing to you. Like the, the wheels start turning in people's minds. And it's not a way of being sneaky. It's just 
Brene Brown's work really is profound and seminal on vulnerability, shame, and mm-hmm. blame. And it's yeah. not woo-woo. This is human stuff. And as long as we're all humans dealing with business, this is always going to be there. And we can ignore it and make our business life hard, or we can embrace it in little chunks. I always tell my clients, you know, I'll meet you where you're at, bump again up against your comfort zone, but I'm very pragmatic. I get how difficult this is, especially when you're juggling business. But um, it, it, we make our lives a lot easier when we actually embrace this stuff as well as we can. So in, in other words, it's okay to show your clients you're human is, is, is part of your perspective here. Be vulnerable, show them your, your human side. And I, I think what, what's so important about that is that actually creates a ton of trust Yes, thank you. It's not just okay. I think you were summarizing what I said. It's a must. And the trust element is critical, right? If I feel I can trust you, I feel safe with you. This is the Hallmark 101 of branding. And if I feel safe with you, I will buy from you. And then I will spread the gospel about you and your brand. That's the external perspective of law firms and clients. The internal perspective of law firm life or corporate life is, Uh, And and Project Aristotle at Google presented this, these facts for your project, right? I think you've referenced it from the stage, right? Psychological Uh, safety. Yes, safety in teens, exactly. So the the process is the same and the trust element is 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 everything, but it, I will not trust you if I don't think you're being human. You know, it's it's not conscious. So when I used to do, um, uh, I used to counsel um, litigators on. Um, I, you know, on the jury perspective, but the flip side, I wouldn't assess the jury. I would assess how the jury sees your client. And I would always say, don't put them in baggy clothes and no facial hair on defendants um, because, you know, white collar crimes, you know, if the defendant had facial hair, they were more likely to, you know, people can't see what's going on. They can't, you know, what's under the facial hair. Why are you wearing baggy clothes? I can't trust you. Right. It's all subconscious. Yeah. Uh, so there was so much subconscious psychology involved there. And it's it's the same thing. It's a trust element. It's a safety element. Now, safety differs by genders, and we work through that in our programs. But it's all the same. And right now, it's really hard to trust anything, right? You can't even trust walking next, next to your neighbor because they don't know they have this, but they may, right? So trust is now shaken even more. So That requires all of us as lawyers, as humans to dig deep and be really authentic. And And, um, and what's so interesting is I I think that if you, if you actually don't show that vulnerability and that human side right now, that will actually breed distrust. And I I know at least for me, I instantly distrust anyone right now that tells me they've got this under control. They've been through a crisis before and know exactly how to navigate this because nobody alive today has navigated this kind of a crisis. Nobody has been through this steep uh, a financial downturn. Nobody has been in this radical of a humanitarian crisis in a worldwide basis. This is all new for everyone. And if you're not a bit freaked out, you're not very human and you're not being very real. So I, I think that's a, uh, that's a great, uh, and, and, and look, Gabby, this has been a fantastic conversation. I know we're running low on time. Uh, maybe a, a closing question or two. One would be, do you believe this crisis will permanently change how law firms operate? Or, or maybe thinking about brand and culture and their overall approach. Are there changes to law firm DNA that you think will be permanent that last beyond this crisis? I certainly hope so, Jack. Uh, we're, I know our focus is on law firms, but I hope on human DNA, really, yep. right? Yep. As, as people take their lawyer to work, right? Yeah. And that will be a really rec- recognizing that what what are we missing right now from being slow in business and how important it is that um, work can actually happen off-site. I know a lot of companies have said mm-hmm. to me, a lot of law firms have said, hey, I didn't think this remote work could work. However, I also hope it opens up their eyes that they've got a lot of people training to do, yes. training of the staff on how to manage, motivate, psychologically empower staff, lawyers, when they're working offsite, there's so many efficiencies from this. I have actually been way more efficient working from home than from the office and traveling all around the globe. However, 
that's necessary too, but how do we become more nimble and thrive and pivot and allow ourselves to um, be open to new things? That's yeah. what I really yeah. hope law firms learn from this. You know, law is based on precedents. And I always say, you know, I think so differently than the average lawyer, <laughs> which when I was chair of the ABA Law Practice Division last year, uh, I was always like questioning things, you know, running the executive committee meetings. I was always the one going, wait a minute, like what? Because we're, we're used to a very precedent set mentality, which doesn't allow us to pivot fast. And that hasn't just been true of law firms. We've seen that what's the result of not pivoting fast enough and not staying open to new ideas. But I hope law firms will take that and remember that their human capital is the more impo most important thing. And that pivoting and being able to be flexible and nimble and efficiency becomes so much more important than process, right? Technology can be such a good tool and a good sister and a good companion to getting you to more efficiency and being nimble. How many times do people roll their eyes now lately? Oh, I don't know how this Zoom thing works. I mean, you and I have been using Zoom like for five, 10 years, right? Something like that. But people don't know. And that's okay. But why don't you know? Why aren't you open to learning, right? And that's where I hope the growth works for people. I truly do. I, uh, I share your optimism there. And, and my final question, Caddy, if you had one takeaway message you wanted to leave our listeners with, either as legal professionals or human beings, what would that be? Oh, um, what's coming up is to be kind to yourself. You know, I think we're in a really rough time in society right now. And I think as lawyers, we're perfectionistic, which makes us great lawyers. I, I was an exceptional securities lawyer. Maybe others wouldn't agree, but I thought so because I was very good at crossing my T's and dotting my I's and being yeah. a perfectionist made me um, very driven. And that was good too, but it didn't always make me very kind to myself, Jack. So um, I want people to have that as takeaway that they should be kind to themselves and take it easy on themselves and um, relax a little bit into lack of control. We didn't even touch into that, but there's a big difference in my world as a brand of being in control versus controlling. And when we're in control, we actually then just sit back and are kinder to ourselves. And so that's what I hope works out for people. That's well, that's a, a fantastic note to end on. Thanks so much for joining us today, Caddy. Really enjoyed our conversation. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Jack. Thanks for joining us on Daily Matters, a podcast from Clio. Rate and review wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Daily Matters is produced by Andrew Booth, Sam Rosenthal, and Derek Bolin, and hosted by yours truly, Jack Newton. Thanks also to Clio, the world's leading cloud-based legal technology provider, for supporting this podcast. For more resources to help lawyers navigate the challenges of COVID-19, please visit clio.com.